Grove, Maryland Observatory and host for this year's meeting. And so I uh, thought it would be a good idea to give a quick overview of the observatory. Um, some people who've been here, we've got a couple uh, NCA members who've been here before quite often. Um, and then uh, lots of new faces. So I'm uh, very happy to see all of y'all and tell you about the observatory. Next slide, please. Uh, so the observatory was uh, started in 1963, and they finished and dedicated it in 1964. Hence, this is our 50th anniversary this year, and we'll be celebrating this fall. Um, and uh, so back then, they started off with $25,000, $60,000 if you include the equipment. Um, and uh, they did the uh, an East Bay extension, and then they... Uh, uh, in 68, the lecture hall in 1977 was added. Um, they've been doing uh, outreach here for most of that time since then. Um, over the last several summers, we've been able to do a number of equipment upgrades using student tech fees, which I'll describe more shortly. Next. So current equipment and you'll get a close-up view of this when we go for the tour down to the telescopes. Uh, we have a West Bay that has a 20-inch uh, bent Eichner Cassegrain. It's a three-mirror system. Then the East Bay has three telescopes uh, in there that belong to the observatory and a telescope that belongs to me in there. Um, the three telescopes, uh, we have an 8-inch NASA astrograph, a 7-inch astrophysics refractor, and a 14-inch uh, Celestron Schmidt Cassegrain. And then my little uh, telescope is a little 6-inch uh, refractor. We also have a number of portable telescopes stored in this building and sort of in the trailer um, that we use for various outreach events uh, like Maryland Day on campus, etc. Next. Um, so some details about each one of the telescopes. Uh, I'm going to kind of skip over these because we'll sort of see these up close a little bit later on and talk about them then. So next, uh, um, one thing we learned recently with the uh, NASA astrograph that Mike Chesney has been very involved in um, is that it's one of the MOTS telescopes, um, part of the Minitrack optical telescope system, so part of the Minitrack radar. Uh, back in way back when, and they had an optical component to it, and this is one of the telescopes from that. And so we've been learning some history on it, which is pretty interesting. Um, next. Then the uh, astrophysics refractor. This telescope um, we've had for a number of years. For many years, we were only using it visually. Um, the mount on that it was on was pretty old and beat up, and basically reduced it to a yank and point system. Um, uh, a few years ago, Dr. Mike Hearn here at the University of Maryland retired, and he uh, permanently loaned us his comet occultation kit. Um, he was interested in observing comets occulting stars, so he could learn more about comets. Unfortunately, he got all this brand new equipment back in late 99, early 2000, right about the same time that his NASA mission, Deep Impact, got approved. So which project did he work on? So all of that equipment was still in brand new boxes, and we uh, inherited it all. So we used uh, one of the part of the equipment included a new mount and sort of first generation astrophysics 900 mount, or actually 1200 mount. So it's a little bit different from what the newer versions look like. But we uh, modified the pier, cut it down through the, uh, put it up there, and so now we have a full research telescope again, which is really, really nice. Next. The 14-inch Celestron, we've had for years. It's been set up for research for years. Um, so we, it's quite useful. Small field of view, that was one of the reasons we really wanted to get the 7-inch up and running as a research instrument, because it has a bigger field of view, which makes it much more uh, user-friendly in terms of trying to do any type of observations that you're going to do light curves and you're doing differential photometry. Next. 
And next. All right, so here in the last few years, we've started doing more research here at the observatory with students. Um, I had a student come up to me back in summer 2011 and saying, hey, can I observe an exoplanet transit? And I laughed at him. <laughs> exoplanet transit, Maryland? Are you kidding me? With which telescope? And uh, at the time, we really only had the 14-inch and 20-inch set up uh, for research. Both of them had a very narrow field of view, very small field of view. And in order to get enough other field stars for comparison, it was just not, I didn't think it was feasible. I did have my telescope set up here and so and some equipment. So we started using my telescope, the little six inch refractor. And the student was extremely motivated and ended up writing his own uh, code for doing differential photometry. He wrote it in Python and has actually had some help from NASA over at Goddard while he interned after graduating from Maryland and before going off to grad school. But uh, he actually managed to observe exoplanet transits with a little six inch refractor. And using that, we were then able to convince the bosses here, you know, my bosses here in the department, hey, we should really upgrade that seven inch telescope. Um, and so that, along with Dr. Hearn retiring, kind of really helped move the seven-inch forward some. So that's one of some of his light curves that he's he had obtained. He uh, submitted several of his uh, light curves into the Exoplanet Transit database. Um, uh, next, uh, he also did. Uh, observations of Calliope and uh, one of its moons were doing uh, mutual eclipses where the little moonlet was eclipsing on Calliope. Um, and there was a call for observations for that and I sent it to him thinking he might be interested and he was. And he ended up doing some observations and a significant amount of analysis on it and he sent it in to whoever did the call. And when the uh, professor submitted it for uh, poster, he was actually listed as one of the co-authors and not just a contributing observer, uh, which was pretty impressive for an undergrad um, because he actually just, the analysis and everything that he did was pretty impressive. Um, so he trained some of the other astroturps, uh, which is a student astronomy club here, and then just using some of the stuff that he's learned. I've been transforming one of my classes into more of a research type program. Next. And so we've been putting together sort of student research teams. And I've got uh, this past fall and spring basically had students uh, from one of my college classes as well as some high school interns working in teams, making uh, hands-on observations with the telescopes here. Uh, they were collecting data. So some of them were doing exoplanet transits. Uh, had a, uh, two of them sort of imaging, observing galaxies to, you know, try to do supernova observations. Um, then had sort of a team um, observing asteroids, trying to get some light curves and such. Um, and then sort of Jovian moons and events. And so they've been, they were learning how to use the equipment, all the software, analysis and all that. It was a lot more hands-on than we'd ever been before in my classes uh, with this equipment. Next. Uh, now, to keep uh, informed about sort of calls for observations, I follow a number of Yahoo groups. I think I'm on over a hundred and fifty Yahoo groups between all the different equipment user groups, software user groups, IOTA and others, minor planet mailing list, comet mailing list, you name it, I'm on it. Uh, if it's astronomy, just sort of staying informed of what's happening. And so that's how I learn a lot about it. Stephen emails me every once in a while, hey, are y'all going to observe this particular one? And we tried, except previously a lot of, uh, we have traditional uh, CCD cameras. And I have tried to do the drift and scan technique and have failed miserably every time, including one time where I had it. I'm pretty sure I did it right, but didn't really save the image right. It was really upsetting. Um, 
So last year uh, we purchased uh, an ADVS um, so that we could actually do some occultations, uh, high speed occultations. Um, and I'll talk about that later this afternoon. And then sort of future wish list in terms of student tech fees are to get like a weather station, all sky camera, things like that to help, you know, really round it out here at the observatory. Next. Now in terms of programs, um, I teach a class called Explore the Universe. It, it was a collaboration between um, freshman, sophomore, living, learning community here on campus. In the sophomore year, the students have to do a project. And so one of the options was to come here to the observatory. Um, I'm transforming how I teach that class into more of this research type program. Um, we've had high school students in the past, but it was from one particular high school. And because of the way that high school has changed how they hold their classes, we don't necessarily have those particular students anymore. So we've kind of opened it up to any high school interns that we may get requ requests and incorporate them into my class, basically. We also have an Astronomy 310 class that meets out here in the fall, Introduction to uh, Observing Techniques. And then we also have an aerospace class that comes out, and they use the 14-inch, the finder scope on the 14-inch to observe satellites. Um, we used to have other intro astro classes coming out here, but because of issues with trying to bust them out here and weather and stuff like that, it, they've kind of changed how they do that. So we don't have quite as many coming out anymore. Next. So our primary public programs include our open houses, which have been running for close to 45 years. Um, they started soon after the observatory opened, but not immediately. Um, it's on the 5th and 20th of each month, which drives some people crazy because it changes what day of the week it falls on, um, so, which consists of sort of a lecture presentation by a faculty or grad student and then a tour of the telescopes and observing. Uh, we do group tours as well uh, during the hour beforehand. Uh, we have this year, this past year, I started doing impromptu observing sessions, which are observing only, weather dependent, and if my husband is out of town so that I can come play. Um, next. Uh, we do some special observing e events for anything that requires a telescope, so like solar eclipses where you need sort of specialized equipment, we'll do an event for. We don't necessarily do events for meteor showers because we're inside the beltway here and so not the best location to observe a meteor shower. Um, but we try to do other events, transits, uh, held programs for those, um, and both did quite well. Next. Um, and then we, I do two sort of training classes for the local amateur community. One is the new telescope owner nights that I hold in January each year. Jay Miller is one of our frequent volunteers helping us with that. Basically, we invite individuals who own a telescope and don't know how to use it to bring it in for one-on-one -on -one help with their telescope. And so we train them how to use their telescope. And we have a cadre of volunteers from the local community. And uh, basically, we people register for the program. We assign them to one of the volunteers. They go and work. And usually, they get about an hour or so of hands-on help. And then they get to practice if it's clear. And uh, works usually pretty well. It's quite popular. fills up every year. The other one is one that I teach in the summertime. It's uh, Learn the Sky Nights. Uh, this was actually <laughs> started sort of by my predecessor, except she started it, and then right as she got all the registrations for it, she got a job somewhere else. So I inherited it, kind of a brand new program. We basically run it as an uh, introduction to amateur astronomy, and it's kind of the astronomy class that a lot of students wish they were probably taking when they're taking Astronomy 101. Um, we actually sort of teach people how, you know, altitude and azimuth, how to find satellites in the sky, you know, uh, what are some of the different objects to observe in the sky, sort of all of the amateur astronomy things to be able to get people to go out and look up. I'm not going to teach about compare and contrast terrestrial and Jovian planets, no stellar evolution, 
that's, that's Astronomy 101. I'm not doing Astronomy 101. Um, in fact, we're starting uh, the next series here on July 21st, so I'm starting to get registrations for that. Next. In terms of staff, there's me, and I'm only half time uh, for the department. I have a technical advisor who's also very, very part time, Dr. Wellnitz. And then we have student uh, workers. Some are volunteers, some are on hourly sal salaries. Uh, we have the guest speakers who are primarily from our faculty and grad students, but we also invite others from a number of institutions. We're very fortunate to have so many other space institutions nearby, so we do have speakers from Goddard and from some of the other facilities. Um, we have our grad students serve as MCs for the programs, and then we also have volunteers for some of our other events. Next. Money. So, um, always a uh, good question. It's a very uh, nebulous fund. Department overhead, which is, you know, everyone else is grabbing more and more of department overhead. So, uh, the last few years, the, one of the main ways that we've actually been able to purchase a lot of our new equipment is through student tech fees. Now, apparently they've been doing student tech fees for years and years and years, but it's only been since about 2011 where I was actively included in the department to submit a proposal of what the observatory wanted. Um, and so through that we've gotten new cameras, new filters, the ADVS. Now to go along with that, we've also been selling books and other stuff, slides, glass film plates and everything. And so during lunchtime and other times you can look through there. Um, and so using those funds, we kind of end up doing sort of matching purchases sometimes. So, for example, this year uh, we s proposed for a new server for the observatory so we can store all the data that's collected and easily serve it out rather than students having to carry thumb drives and disks and such. And also new control computers for some of our cameras. But we only got approved for, I think, two control cameras and we need two others. So we'll probably do them all four by matching with some funds from the what we raised through book sales and such. And then most of it, our events are free, but we for the Learn the Sky Nights, because of the number of goodies and such, we do charge a small fee. Next should be about it. We don't do any really paid advertising. It's all through the websites and our social networks. I do have a mailing list, which is actually over 700 now. Um, as well as contacts with all the local clubs. Um, Blaine Friedlander does a monthly Skywatch column in the Washington Post, and he often includes our events in there and emails me immediately when we're behind on updating our schedule. Um, and then every once in a while we get articles in the student newspaper and other sort of local papers. Next. Uh, we have sort of some collaborations. We uh, also host the National Capital Astronomers here at the observatory. Um, I've got email contact with most of the area clubs and in fact draw most of my volunteers from the area clubs. Student Astronomy Club and during 2009 IYA, we, with the local clubs, um, we put together a Google Calendar uh, Astronomy in DC to kind of try to showcase and let people in the region know about astronomy events that were happening through the clubs and such. So most of the clubs participate in that. Um, next. Uh, some of our challenges is getting speakers. Our faculty are a little bit slow sometimes to respond. We have some faculty that are awesome and volunteer every year, but there are other faculty who have yet to give a presentation here even though they've been in the department for years and years and years. Um, over advertising, sometimes we don't know about articles that are published about us. Um, for example, in uh, 2009, Labor Day weekend, they did a nice, wonderful spread about uh, if you can't get out of town, here are the top 10 things that you can do in three hours locally. Number one, go to the UMD Observatory. And this was published on Friday, 4 September. And we had open house on 5th of September, and we had 300 people show up. It was an interesting night. Um, and deteriorating buildings. This place is close to 50 years old, and 
sometimes I, you know, hear that they kind of originally con constructed as sort of a temporary facility with the idea of getting a bigger, better one down the road. Well, we're kind of stuck with it now. So, and then next should be done. Okay, so that's how you can uh, find out about us. We're on the web. We're on Facebook. I'm on Twitter, uh, trying to post stuff. So, thank you. And we'll do sort of the actual tour of the building, which is next door. You'll get to see it. A roll off roof and everything. We'll play with that sort of during lunchtime somehow. And I wandered off. Sorry. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks for being our host. Yes, it is.